time, a time to reflect, a time to be together. Uh, we had our Christmas Eve service last night, and uh, Johanna did this painting for us to remind us of what we're doing. Um, I see we have a lot of family here today, uh, people who are in town, this or that, and don't you know that Jen and I have a company? Um, Jen's sister, Mandy, is in town with us today. We're glad to have her. Um, but just to be sure while she's been here, uh, let's see. We, she had to watch us spend the evening at the vet hospital because our dog got into our Christmas candy. <laughs> and then we found out we were on a water boil order. Uh, so we have no water. And then supposedly, I was told at one point we were going to be under a tornado watch today. <laughs> So I'm pretty sure she's going to go back to Florida and never return. <laughs> but hopefully if we're kind, um, I, hope, I hope you enjoy being here and um, the wonderful time of Christmas together. That changed really quickly. Okay, all right. <laughs> As we get started today, I'm thinking about in our church, our tradition, when we get to... Uh, part of the service where sometimes people uh, join our church or they're baptized, they come up and we always ask them to repeat a phrase just so that we know we believe each other. And usually I ask them to say something like, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that is based on a confession that Peter made um, in three of the Gospels when uh, Jesus asked them, who do people say I am? And the one part that's always bothered me when I ask people to repeat that, I believe Jesus is the Christ, is the question in the back of my mind as to whether or not people know what Christ actually means. And as I was thinking about that in Christmas, I was considering um, what Christ really means. And basically, in a very um, elementary sense, the word Christ really means the King. And Christ as King is something that we have lost, something we've not emphasized in a long time. Now, technically, if you want to get into the detail, uh, the Greek word Christ is equivalent to the Hebrew word Messiah. Christ, Messiah, they both mean the Anointed One, literally. And if you go back in time, the Anointed One um, was uh, anointing was when someone was designated for a special task before oil on their heads and dedicated them at that task, and one of the most well-known ones was king. And so the king would be anointed, and then as you went through the Old Testament, uh, they started developing the idea of a particular king, a messiah, that would come and change everything from beginning to end, the messiah, or in Greek, the Christ. It's the king, the one who's coming is going to change it all. And I say that because I think that when we look at the Christmas story, we find that Christ, or Jesus as King, is something all through that Christmas story that we maybe don't emphasize as much as we could. Because it was on that night that a baby was born, and it scared a king. If you've read that part of the story. So... With that going on, let's turn to our Bibles and look at a few places through Scripture where this emphasis of Christ as King happens over and over and over again. So, uh, Matthew chapter 2, uh, and we'll begin at the beginning of that chapter. We're going to get the story of the wise men, also called Magi, depends on your translation, but these wise men who saw the star in the sky and traveled to meet Jesus at his birth. And they had one particular belief about this baby. So beginning there, verse 1 says this. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who is to be born? What is this? King of the Jews. We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. And when Herod, who is, by the way, the current king in that area, when Herod, King Herod, heard this, he was disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and chiefs of the law, he asked them where the Messiah, king, was to be born. 
in Bethlehem, Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written. And this is a prophecy out of Micah. But you, Bethlehem, the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. What's happening in the story is two kings facing each other. One is supposedly the king of the Jews, a baby being born this night, the other, King Herod. And they can't both hold the same title. And so Herod's upset. Now he tells the Magi to tell him exactly where he finds the baby, but he is pulling a ruse. He wants to know where the baby is because he has a plan. We find that out later in verse 16. Uh, the Magi, by the way, um, uh, heard in a dream not to return and tell Herod, and so Herod's upset about it. Verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. So in other words, he is so afraid of this baby being born that they, that they are calling the king of the Jews, so afraid he could lose his post, that he says he will destroy, uh, murder all of the children two years and under in order to try and get this and wipe it out. The king of the Jews, in no way, I'm the king. It was the night a baby scared a king. Now, to be honest, when I hear the word baby, I get scared too. <laughs> but for different reasons. <laughs> but on that night, a baby scared a king. And that's not the first time this emphasis that Jesus as king of the Jews appeared. So, uh, if you're in Matthew, turn, turn back to chapter 1, to the very, very beginning. Do you know how the New Testament begins? begins with a wonderful and memorable genealogy. A genealogy is when you uh, list out where everyone uh, came from in terms of their history, their family, their lineage. And so you go to Matthew chapter 1 and you get the begets. Have you heard of this section? So-and-so begets so-and-so, who begets so-and-so, who begets so-and-so, who was the mother of so-and-so, who begets so-and-so, all the way down uh, from Abraham to Jesus. And it's curious to us as to why they would bother opening the New Testament with such a boring section. And yet this is the beginning of the Christmas story. And maybe we get an idea. We get down to verse 17. And it says, Thus there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. So one of the points of this genealogy, as best as I can tell, is to point out the line through which Jesus was born. And he takes it back through a, uh, a very important person, a, a king uh, linchpin here, by the name of King David. Because if you were going to be a king, you had to be from a kingly line, right? You didn't apply for the job of king. You were born into it. And because of the importance of lineage and genealogy, they decided to open the New Testament by pointing out that Jesus descended from the line of the kings. In fact, he was born in Bethlehem, the city of David, the king. He's the king of the Jews, that's the point. And we get this recurring theme, Christ Messiah, anointed one, king. Go a little further. In Matthew chapter 4, uh, Jesus has been now baptized by John the Baptist. He's gone out to the desert and fasted for 40 days and 40 nights and been tempted by Satan. And now he's ready to begin his ministry. He comes home and he preaches his first sermon. And in chapter 4, verse 17, it summarized this way. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. 
And for the remainder of his ministry, the emphasis on the kingdom of heaven will be there. He will begin the Beatitudes in chapter 5, and blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And he will continue to uh, do parables to say, and the kingdom of heaven is life. Now, by the way, if there is a kingdom of heaven, then who is the king of the kingdom of heaven? He just actually doesn't really say all that clearly. The implication is there. That he is the king of his own kingdom. By the very emphasis on the kingdom of heaven, that idea is played out throughout the Gospels. And it changes everything. And you can go from the beginning of his life and now jump through some of that ministry part and get to the end of his life and see how the continued emphasis on him as king made others afraid besides just King Herod. So uh, move forward and go to Luke chapter 19 and hear the story of Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday we recognize the Sunday before Easter uh, celebrates that time when Jesus rode into Jerusalem in victory uh, near the end. Uh, he rode in uh, that week um, triumphant and people cheered him and by Friday they were streaming for his crucifixion. The last week of his life. And there's an interesting point out of this. So you're in Luke chapter 19 and you read this story. Um, Jesus sends off his disciples to go get for him a donkey that he is going to use to ride in. So in verse 35, they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colts, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the ground. And when, they, they, when he came near the place where the road goes down to the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And then hear their chorus. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And then some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They called you king. They implied that you were something way out there and dramatic, like you were a Messiah or something. And Jesus responds, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, these stones will cry out. It's almost a humorous response, like, well, you know what, if I made them be quiet, I'm pretty sure someone would praise this moment, even if it was the rocks and the ground. It's, um, it's quippy. It's witty. Um, in this moment, uh, Jesus is riding the colt of a donkey, which goes back to a prophecy in Zechariah about their ruler and king riding into town on a donkey, which was ironic because usually a king would ride a beautiful stallion or steed or whatever the proper term is for a fancy horse. <laughs> <laughs> Someone could tell me later, I don't know. A mare? <laughs> I'm going to stop there. <laughs> they called him king, and it upset the Pharisees. And they said, you need to make them be quiet. I said, no, they're right. I'm the king. And that's as he rides into town. And of course, everything turns the wrong way. Uh, the the uh, Pharisees will arrest him, put on trial. They don't have the power to, uh, to actually execute him. So they take him to the Romans. And their accusation to the Romans is to say, uh, because they wouldn't care. The Romans wouldn't care if Jesus was blasphemous or said something they didn't like or went against the system of the time. The only thing the Romans might possibly care about is if he was causing an insurrection and claiming to be a king himself. And they said, yeah, he's, he's not in favor of the king and Caesar, you know. He's claiming to be a king. And so uh, Pilate calls Jesus in to question him on it. And so here we are in Matthew 27. Jesus standing before Pilate, verse 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? That was the accusation. You have said so, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer 
Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Pilate looks him square in the eye and says, Are you the king of the Jews? You said it yourself. This um, accusation of him being a king, the one that scared King Herod, is now being brought before Governor Pilate. And it's not being let go. Move forward a little bit more. In Matthew chapter 27, go to verse 27 and following, we get the famous story of the soldiers mocking and flogging Jesus. And what did they do? Well, they, they whipped him and they, they hurt him and they did all of these things. And then what did they place on his head? A crown of thorns. Did you get that? A crown of thorns. Which this is more than just a torture or hurt him device. This is a mocking. Right? Have you ever thought of that? They didn't just put the crown of thorns. They put a robe on him. They got a staff. They knelt down and said, Hail, King of the Jews. This isn't just um, a traditional story we've heard. This is mocking for the thing that people claimed he was, the king. So you get that verse, uh, verse 27. <clears throat> then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. It's very royal. Roar, uh, royal. I didn't say the word. And then they twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand and they knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews. Uh, they said, they spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put, on, put his own clothes on him. They led him away to crucify him. The accusation of being king of the Jews continues to follow him, and that becomes absolutely clear when they put him up on the cross and they hang a sign above his head. Move over to John chapter 19, and we get this part of the story. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. This is the sign above Jesus' head. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, what? The king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. And the accusation that was made against him was there a permanent, well, permanent, written above his head for all the world to see in no less than three languages. King of the Jews. Now you tell me that when we stand up here and we say Jesus is the Christ, we are saying he is the king, the anointed one, the Messiah. It was the thing that was big enough to scare a king and to scare the Romans into crucifying him. It was the accusation that hung above his head and the reason the Magi traveled to worship. And what is amazing about Christmas, perhaps more than anything else, is that on Christmas Day we realized that Jesus, though he was a king, would not be the kind of king they expected. Because if you think of the entry of a king into this world, you would not think of Christmas Day. Because there was no room for him in the inn. They didn't even make room for the king of the Jews. They placed him in a manger, which is basically a feeding trough. Not where you would expect to find a baby or a king. He was first greeted by workaday shepherds who got the message before all of the diplomats of the time that a king was born. It wasn't the entry you would expect for the king of the Jews, and Christmas reminds us that he was a different kind of king. To say that Jesus is the Christ, to call him Jesus Christ, is not to say that Christ is his last name, 
What if we changed the way we spoke about it? What if we said, what if when we were walking along and stubbed our toe, we didn't say Jesus Christ, what if we said, Jesus the King? I know, it's a little tricky, I'm sorry, but just, what if we emphasize? It would mean something different, wouldn't it? When you realize what that word actually meant. What if when we were playing checkers and we, we jumped over and got to the end of the line and we said Christ King instead of King King? What if we realized that those, that's what that word means? This more than just a something we put at the end of his name. What if we realized that the first ever king size bed was just a manger? Because the king laid in it. Christ equals king. Messiah equals king. And when you confess him to be that, it changes your life. And so I ask you today, as we reflect on Christmas, as we try and finish up early, as we make this um, a day of thinking of that Christmas morning and what happened as we have the painting, <coughs> have you made Christ the king of your life? Have you given him that power? Have you submitted and allowed him to be ruler beyond anything else? Or are you afraid that there's a king out there over your life, someone other than you? It's time to realize that there is something beyond us. There's a king waiting, a Christ, a Messiah, an anointed one, predicted from the beginning, who came and is going to come again. Christ is king. But because of Christmas, it's a different kind of king than we expected. Father in heaven, I thank you for who you are. I thank you for your son and for Christmas Day. We come here today and we reflect on his entry into the world, which changed everything. God, I, I want you, Lord, to um, be honored and acknowledged and praised on this day of all days. Because this was the moment that hope was born. This was the moment that a baby scared a king. And Lord, um, we give you that rightful place as ruler over all, ruler over nations, uh, ruler over rulers, ruler over our lives. And so, um, Lord, we acknowledge that you are a different kind of king than anyone expected. You are not one to raise an army or fight which shocked the people of the time. But Lord, by your grace, you are a merciful servant king who loved and gave his life for all that we might be with you. Lord, that is a different kind of king, but it is one we are ready to serve and honor. So we give you the glory you deserve on this day, this short service, this message. And we go home to our families to remember what is behind all of this, the story of the birth of your son. Because of him, Lord, we have hope today, and we can have hope tomorrow and beyond, because you have conquered and you will. In the name of your son we pray, amen. Please stand.